I remember when I was a child, uh, and my mom would occasionally drop me off at school, elementary school, and she'd get me to school early, and I would make my way to the cafeteria. All of the tables and chairs would be set aside, and inside the now empty lunchroom, a dozen other students and I would stand several feet spaced apart, and a teacher would give us stretches to do and instruct us on sort of an imaginative yoga. I remember one time in particular, she said that we were all seeds, and that we would grow and become trees. So she instructed us all to take the shapes of small curled up balls on the floor. And then in eight steps, she would say, grow, grow, grow. And each time she said grow, we would take on another form. We would slightly evolve from the small seed until we became a full tree. Sometimes people would grow too quickly and the teacher would warn them saying, you have to give yourself room to grow because you still have a couple more steps left. So slow down. And one by one, she would say, grow, grow. And we would unfurl from little seeds into small plants until we were all the way outstretched with all of our fingers splayed out. I remember the warm light that poured in from a window facing the interior courtyard of the school. I remember the polished, seamless brown speckled linoleum floors that were polished so shiny that they were blinding as the morning sun shone down on them. I remember the chatter of birds and the morning dove giving its soft coo. I don't remember much from my childhood, but I remember this. This memory is a powerful memory inside of my mind, and I don't remember very much growing up, but I very distinctly remember one of these days. However, if some omniscient being told me, actually, that was just a dream that you internalized and made reality in a memory inside your own head, I don't think I would doubt them. There's something about the experiences of a child being so real and yet unreal at the same time, especially when looking back on them from adulthood. It truly did feel like a dream. There is a fear that I have in making this video, and that is I have literally written thousands of words dissecting Dreamcore and the Feywild and comparing the two. And after writing these words, so much of it to me feels repetitive and redundant, like I'm repeating the same ideas, and yet so much of it also feels disparate, like I'm desperately trying to force two things to coexist together that don't actually relate that much to each other. So that conflict makes me believe that there is something there that's worth doing, because either I have failed in a spectacularly unique way in total contradiction, or I have uncovered something a little bit interesting. Quickly, I'm going to tell you what this video is for. This video is made to explore and analyze the aesthetics of Dreamcore and the Feywild, providing insights into their key components, such as visuals, mythology, surrealism, and emotional resonance. Either way, I hope that you enjoy the video. Thanks for watching. The aesthetic evolution of contemporary culture is a fascinating journey through different styles, each offering a unique perspective on reality and the realm of imagination. Weird core, dream core, cottage core, core core, and other cores have risen into the mainstream via TikTok over the past few years. This development of aesthetics comes off the coattails of Tumblr aesthetics that preceded them that probably rose from an iteration of something else. While there are countless amounts of cores and aesthetics being forged every day, in this video I want to explore two aesthetics in particular, Dream Core and the Feywild. Dream Core is a recently popular aesthetic, and the Feywild is a setting within Dungeons and Dragons. As we begin, let's start with the more recent of the two ideas, and that is Dream Core. The term Dream Core was likely coined in the early 2020s, and a lot of its imagery is based on early 2000s images. Now, before we get into the ideas and the things that bind these two things together, um, I've seen a lot of video essays talk about the aesthetics and the study of aesthetics, but I never really actually understood what aesthetics were. So I'm going to define that for you right now. Aesthetics refers to the principles and theories that guide the evaluation and understanding of beauty, taste, and art. Aesthetics examines the nature of art, the creation and appreciation of beauty, and ways in which individuals perceive and interpret art. And the formal definition of what I just said kind of informs the informal version of aesthetic that we all kind of know today, and that is a vibe. An aesthetic essentially is the vibe of something that is captured through what you see, what you hear, what you ingest medially from the subject. I think maybe we could today describe aesthetic as the way that we perceive something by 
by our senses and our emotional responses. And that may be way too broad of a definition. However, the way that the word aesthetic is used today, that's just kind of what it is. Dreamcore is a surreal aesthetic, and it mainly has to do with dreams, daydreams, nightmares, the surreal, and it's typically found on different pieces of media like images online, videos, and oftentimes music as well. Key elements of Dreamcore include base images, like an unrealistic terrain or a structure, or even fantasy-like lands, which are then overlaid with different elements to create a dreamlike quality. Other common features of Dreamcore are Teeth, eyes, angels, rainbows, old CRT TVs as heads, strange people, um, RPG elements like text box or text overlays that are placed around the scenery, as well as sparkles, orbs, flowers, mushrooms, and other strange creatures. These visuals are usually lighter toned and pastel in color or bright and vivid, capturing the uncanny and often elusive feeling of dreams. The more contemporary definition of liminal spaces are integral to the aesthetic, that being strange and nostalgic settings that makes one feel uneasy. Characters within Dreamcore are often heard but not seen, and they aid in telling a story or creating a scenario that one might feel in a dream. All of these elements kind of come together to form what we know as Dreamcore. Now, over time, Dreamcore has also been associated with the backrooms, but I don't really think that they are the same. I think that the backrooms is a phenomenon that has become extremely popular, and Dreamcore is pretty contemporary, and so, of course, people are mashing the two together because they both deal with the surreal, but I don't think that they're the same thing. And you know what? If you're interested in this video and things like it, then please why don't you hit like and subscribe right now because I think that you're going to like the rest of this. Now let's talk about the underlying ideas that I believe comprise Dream Core. And number one, and maybe most importantly, is nostalgia. The familiar, often from the past, is reimagined in a dream-like context, creating a sense of longing or reminiscence. Much of the visuals used to compose Dreamcore elements are pieces and parts from the mid to late 1990s to the mid to late 2000s, obviously because many from that group have transitioned from childhood into adulthood, and are now arbiters of internet development, and likely serve as the creators of Dreamcore. However, the imagery and visualizations can extend further back, as when reminiscing about my childhood. Many people, including myself, grew up in a place that was surrounded by things that preceded their existence. So for instance, when I was growing up, I had a floor that was like this burgundy shag carpet. I had these wood vinyl walls. I would, I, I, my house looked like it was made in the 1960s because it was. And so I believe that even these older ideas, things that preceded our births, add to the collection of Dreamcore. In Dreamcore, music or sounds may evoke a sense of nostalgia, such as samples from older songs or sound effects from past decades that are often woven into tracks of Dreamcore. This auditory element of nostalgia further immerses the audience in a dreamlike state, blurring the boundaries between past, present, reality, and dream. Typically, the audio used in Dreamcore is warbled, sounding like it comes from an old degraded videotape, like those which were rewound and watched a few too many times. It's often a retro or vintage style of music that would be played from an old record or found on old media, consisting of genres like orchestral swing and even vaudeville and other old-timey genres, although certainly other songs from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s are not safe from our nostalgic view. The next element that is a part of Dreamcore is Ruin Lust. See, nostalgia serves to paint a picture in our minds of what the past was like. It kind of tints our eyes as we look back and we imagine what the past was that we experienced, not fully a memory, but rather a feeling of memories. And truly, our memories serve us most potently, our experiences, but it's likely that when you look back at an old color photograph from the 60s or 70s that you're reminded of childhood as well. The grain of the photos can remind you of those giant floral photo albums that you would investigate as a child at your grandparents' house as you laid around bored for hours in the summer months. You can feel a connection to a time before you, and even a longing for a simpler time. You can look back at those photos that are found in those photo books and wish that you were there. 
That is ruin lust. It's looking at that which was the past and is no longer a part of our present, but still vying and wishing for it. It's also known as ruin value. And all the people who say, oh, I'm born at the wrong time. I should have been born in the 40s or 50s or 60s. Those people are experiencing a strong feeling of ruin lust. However, this idea is not new at all and is actually presented in very old English literature. The elegiac poem, The Ruin, is one of the best examples of this concept. The poem is a lament for the decay of a once grand city, possibly the Roman city of Bath, and it's filled with reflections on the transience of earthly glory and the ravages of time. This poem evokes a sense of wonder and longing as it invites the reader to imagine the city in its prime and the lives of the people who once inhabited it. It's a form of imaginative and emotional engagement with a past that we never experienced. We're allowed to project our own fantasies, desires, and even our memories onto something that we were never there for. And I believe it's nostalgia and ruin lust that'll give us that really strong emotional resonance in Dreamcore. The third element of dream core that I want to talk to you about is liminality. Liminality is a state of transition where something is not yet from one place or another. Spaces can exist in this liminal setting. These spaces are often devoid of human presence. They exude an aura of solitude, reflecting an ephemeral and abstract quality of a dream itself. The incorporation of liminal spaces into dream core does more than just enhance its visual appeal. It taps into the psychological underpinnings of the aesthetic. While the ambiguity of liminal spaces may unsettle some, sparking a desire for a more tangible, definable reality, others may find solace in these open, undefined expanses, seeing them as an opportunity for introspection and self-discovery. Just as Ruin Lust kind of gives us this opportunity for projection with something that is historical and true, but also not our own. Own, I believe that the same exists with liminality, except it's more of a fantasy. Liminality or liminal spaces, at least in the way that we're experiencing them today in the back rooms and all this kind of culture, they are these imaginative, free, creative, fantastic spaces that we truly can't engage with, but we can imagine what it would be like to engage with. While nostalgia is the feeling that we have of a vying connection to our own past, and ruin lust is a vying connection to a past that we did not exist in, liminal spaces kind of serve for us to project our feeling of a vying for a fantastic place that does not exist. In technical terms, liminal spaces just means a transitionary place, but in today's culture, it's evolved to become kind of this very surreal real element. And so we can imagine what it would be like to engage with these fantastic non-existent spaces. Dreamcore as a whole is rooted in these ideas of nostalgia, ruin, lust, and liminality, but it's also very much a product of contemporary art, contemporary media, and the internet as a whole. Now in this next section, we're going to tackle the Feywild, a fantastical setting in D&D. And then after that, we're going to compare the aesthetics of Dreamcore and the Feywild. The Feywild in the context of D&D is a fantastical setting that mirrors the real world in Dungeons and Dragons, otherwise known as the Material Plane. Sometimes referred to as the Plane of Fairy, the Feywild is a place of extreme emotion, wild magic, and abundant life. Its landscapes are more vibrant, its creatures more magical, and its dangers more terrifying than what's typically typically found in the mortal realm. The Feywild shares a notable connection to the iconic world of Alice in Wonderland. Both landscapes are rooted in the surreal and the whimsical, pushing the boundaries of imagination and creating a sense of wonderment. Like Alice's journey through the rabbit hole, entering the Feywild often feels like stepping into a world turned upside down, where the ordinary rules of nature are suspended and replaced with a logic all on its own. In both realities, the unexpected is the norm, creating an immersive experience that is disorienting as it is captivating. The Feywild, as it's known in Dungeons & Dragons, draws a ton of inspiration from our own mythological stories and tales from the real world, specifically from the Celtic, the Norse, and the British traditions. Celtic traditions are rich in the stories from the other world, which details a place of deities, strange spirits, and weird landscapes that come together to form a terrifying, if not fantastic, setting. There are similarities of the other world and our world, but also distinct differences that make 
them dangerous to traverse. Norse mythology contributes to the Feywild through its portrayal of Alfheim, the realm of light elves, which is depicted as a beautiful and radiant place. Additionally, the idea of powerful Fey entities could be influenced by Aesir and Vanir, the two main group of gods in Norse mythology. British folklore adds another layer of richness to the Feywild with its tales of the fairy folk or Fey. These stories often depict the Fey as mischievous or even malicious beings who live in an enchanted realm separated from the human world an idea that is reflected in the Feywild's inhabitants and their unpredictable nature. Most of the creatures that inhabit the Feywild are directly drawn from our real world, like satyrs, redcaps, gnomes, mermaids, and much more. But the Feywild doesn't just use some of these more random common creatures, they also pull from the big names themselves. For instance, Titania, the queen of the fairies in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, is presented as the summer queen in D&D, ruling over the Seely Court in the Feywild. But it's important to note that a lot of these inspirations that the Feywild draws from are not exact replications of the real world lore, at least not entirely, even though a lot of them are very similar. Another important element of the Feywild is its landscapes. The Feywild is known for its whimsical and unpredictable nature, and this is reflected in its aesthetics. The settings and landscapes are marked by their grandeur and enchantment, characterized by impossibly tall trees, floating islands, endless twilight, and vibrant colors that seem to shift and change. It's not merely a setting, but a living, breathing entity that's deeply interconnected with its inhabitants. The grass, trees, vines, and flowers aren't just static elements of the landscape, they're often personified, exhibiting traits and behaviors that give them an anima, or a spirit, a character all their own. This makes the setting of the Feywild itself feel like a living, breathing creature. The grass in the Feywild doesn't just grow, it sways and dances, reacting to the presence of those who wander through it. The trees don't just stand silent and immovable, they whisper secrets into the wind, their branches reaching out as if communication or camaraderie with each other. Vines stretch and curl like sentient beings, offering a path or hindrance depending on their whims. Flowers in their myriad of fantastical colors and forms seem to watch with an almost conscious curiosity, their petals opening and closing in response to nearby activity. And this personification isn't tied to the flora either. It is everything. The rocks, the wind, the air. A stream could lead a group of traveling adventurers to a different location because it can reroute its path depending on where it wants them to go. Adventurers in the Feywild have to understand that the plane itself is a being and they have to treat it with respect as they traverse it. Feywild is the ultimate representation of the fantastic, or fantasy. The word fantastic actually has its roots in French, fantastique, which has its roots in Latin, fantasticus, which has its roots in Greek, fantasticos. And the word in Greek, fantasticos, means to be able to create mental images. It was used in English from the 14th century to mean existing only imagination, and then from the 16th century to refer to the strange and bizarre. It wasn't until the 20th century that we started using it to describe things that were supernatural or greater than reality itself, being fantasy. And that brings me to the third thing which I believe helps embody the Feywild. And actually, that is that the Feywild is embodied by the fantastic. The Feywild is an otherworldly realm of beauty and magic born from imagination, steeped in magic and mysticism, and populated with mythical creatures and powerful deities. The Feywild's inherent connection to the elements of fantasy is reflected in its richly detailed landscapes, brimming with vibrant supernatural flora and fauna, and its inhabitants ranging from whimsical pixies to formidable archfey. The realm itself, with its eternal twilight skies, towering sentient plant life, and cities crafted from woven vines and luminescent flowers, seems to have sprung straight from a dream or a storybook. In its essence, the Feywild captures the fundamental elements of the fantastic. It invites the beholder into a world that exists beyond the confines of reality, where the extraordinary is commonplace and the laws of nature are guided by its whims of magic. The Feywild in all of its splendor and unpredictability represents the limitless potential of imagination, which is at the heart of the genre of fantasy. It is meant to draw players in with its uncanny and unpredictable element of whimsy. Its fantastical elements tied to nature and emotion help kind of carve its space out of the D&D multiverse.
you've probably heard me say this word somewhere between five and 500 times this video so far, and that is surreal. This is truly where the Feywild and Dreamcore are tied together. They are molded, governed, and totally enraptured by surrealism. Diving into the surreal is like stepping through a warbled mirror. This is the link between two seemingly disparate concepts that share the surreal as their unifying thread. Surreal is a term that originates from the cultural movement known as surrealism, which began in the early 20th century. The movement is best known for its visual artworks and writings that sought to release the creative potential of the unconscious mind, for example, by the irrational juxtaposition of images. In a broader sense, the surreal is used to describe the bizarre, the truly uncanny. It refers to experiences or situations that you cannot believe are real because they are so utterly impossible. In the context of art, literature, and aesthetics, surreal elements often involve the blending or blurring the line between dream and reality, the familiar and unfamiliar, or the natural and the supernatural. The Feywild, being a parallel plane to the mortal realm of the D&D universe, is a surreal landscape of capricious nature and fantastical beings. This alive and mysterious world taps into something unconsciously within us that makes us believe that the world is unfamiliar and yet mesmerizing. We are unable to look away because it barely reminds us of something that is true. On the other hand, Dreamcore utilizes surrealism to capture and convey the often indescribable nature of dreams. Its aesthetic hinges on the use of dreamlike surreal visuals and soundscapes, creating a sense of familiarity wrapped in the extraordinary. The aesthetic employs the surreal to offer glimpses of floating buildings, liminal spaces, and characters with surreal features. These elements come together to encapsulate the ethereal and the unpredictable, leading the observer into the rabbit hole that is dreams. While the Feywild and Dreamcore are different, they converge at the point of the surreal. Beyond just the surreal, there are other elements that the two aesthetics and ideas share a lot of as well. And while I mentioned nostalgia under the Dreamcore category, I believe it's strong enough that I should talk about it a little bit in the context of how both of them encapsulate nostalgia. Specifically, I see them converging at nostalgia with this nostalgic, whimsical element that's often brought on by this childlike sense of wonder. While Dreamcore has this kind of nostalgic feeling of like, I feel like I remember this place existing once before in my own life, the nostalgia that is present in the Feywild is more that of fairy tales that we've experienced as children and now reflect on as adults, like Hansel and Gretel, the Three Little Pigs, and other fairy tales that evoke that childlike sense of fear and wonder. Another element that I feel is strongly present in both ideas is the idea of uh, strange rules and unusual customs. Have you ever been in a dream before and for some reason you had to hold on to an iPod touch and you have no idea why, but you knew that it was so important that you could not let go and you would clench your fist tight, fearing everything if you were to let go of this iPod touch because for some reason it was very important and everyone was looking at you and everybody was hoping For God's sake, please do not drop that iPod touch. I've at least dreamt weird dreams like that before, and I would wake up and my hand would be clenched in some kind of weird fist, or everybody would be looking at me, expecting for me to know what to do in a certain strange scenario walking down the street, but I, for some reason, was not in on the custom. The same thing applies not only to dreams, but to the Feywild, where simply offering your name to somebody can be giving them ownership over your being. Fey creatures will often play tricks with these strange customs, never receive a favor or a gift for you will be indebted to whatever creature offered it to you in the first place. If somebody says, may I have your name? You say, no, thank you. You may not. In Dreamcore, and it's kind of greater and greater affiliation with the backrooms and all of these strange rules that are very SCP oriented, there are rules that you must be aware of as well. For example, don't look at the man with no face. And if you are in the pink room, then please do not lick the walls. And lastly, one of the unique connectors between these two ideas is the perception and experience of time. Time is unique in the Feywild, where if you exit the mortal material plane and go to the Feywild, one day in the Feywild could be one second in the material plane, or it could be a hundred years. 
time is experienced differently and memory of that time is no different. A similar idea is in dream core as well. Being in a dream, you cannot tell how long or how short of a time that you have been there. This idea is presented in Inception and many other films depicting dreams because truly it feels like you can live an entire lifetime within a dream only to wake up and not remember any of it, except for bits and pieces that come as memories of dreams. The strange perception and experience of time adds to that mysterious and enchanting layer of the dream core and the Feywild. And before we wrap up, I just have one final remark about dream core and the Feywild. I believe that dream core can be viewed as our modern day Feywild, just as the Feywild or the domain of fairies or the other world is the past's version of whimsy, fantasy, a distorted mirror of reality, so too is Dreamcore for our modern times. Both realms are woven from the threads of nostalgia, pulling at places of childhood memories, stirring feelings of heartache and evoking pathos. They represent the raw, childlike feelings that are unburdened by the constraints of rationality or logic. These shared themes and elements point to a universal human desire for escapism, for a place that exists beyond the mundane, where the fantastic and the surreal can be freely explored. Well, well, welcome back. I can't help it. I'm a sucker for practical advice, and so I thought I'd rejoin you on the porch as we wrap up this video, and I give you a few tips on how to make a D&D game more dream core. And I've got my handy dandy script with me. Number one, surreal landscapes. When you're describing a game and trying to set a dream core like setting, you should probably consider how you're describing the landscapes. Allow physics to break the norm. Create inverted cities, floating islands, trees with pastel leaves that mix and match and that mean different things. Additionally, not only do you need to consider the landscapes, but also consider travel and transportation as well. It's common for dreams to just start in one place and then end up in another place. So it wouldn't be that crazy if players just randomly ended up from one place to another. Don't overdo that, obviously, because that could become very annoying, but it could be interesting a couple times. Number two, nostalgic elements. I don't think that there's anything wrong with evoking some things that we understand or would uh, feel in real life. You know, maybe like the music from Alice in Wonderland or the like, or perhaps even just a childlike sense of wonder that kind of helps bring an emotional resonance to the character. Maybe even some NPCs or the parents of the characters make their way into this wonderland somehow. Number three, uh, use few NPCs. NPCs and characters, I feel like, uh, kind of take away from the very lonely, nostalgic feeling that Dreamcore kind of gives. And if you do introduce NPCs, make them almost like aliens. They can look and talk like everybody else, but perhaps their language or their words are all jumbled up and only a few players can understand, even though they're not technically speaking a language the character knows. And there are a few other planes that would help evoke the sense of surrealism that Dreamcore presents. Obviously the Feywild. Now there also are a few elemental planes. I think specifically the plane of air and of earth would really make a, a very surreal game. Um, you could do the ethereal plane, limbo, um, there's a lot out there that I think kind of all mishmash together with that very surreal experience. Also, did I mention that there's a plane of dreams? <laughs>